something about that distorted heart of yours. What will you do? Will you jump? Or would you rather die here? You're mine. So you know Persona 5 is a great game. It's probably the best traditional JRPG I've played since, well, the release of Persona 4. There is a lot to love here. If you are just looking for an opinion on the game's quality, there you go. It is worth $60 and potentially much more than even that. Take a week off, go buy it, ignore your real life loved ones, get a new waifu and have fun. However, if you have even a passing knowledge of me and my channel, you know that I have kind of a personal relationship with the big Persona games. It's kind of a big deal for me. So the question I found myself asking as I played through Persona 5 wasn't, is this good? But rather, is this as good as Persona 3 and 4? Is that fair to the game? Nope. But I am ultimately a fan. And being a fan of something changes how you experience it. And, in my opinion, it's better to embrace and work with that fact than to desperately try and most likely fail to avoid it. I, like a lot of people, am coming to this game with almost unrealistically high expectations. But I can promise they are no higher than the expectations set by the two games that came before it. And given how much of the core team from Persona 3 and 4 has remained around for 5, I don't think the expectations are unreasonable. In fact, it's not an expectation. It's a standard, because they're the ones who set it. So, with all of this in mind, let's hone in on our one core question. Is Persona 5 as good as Persona 3 and 4? This is a question with a lot of answers, and a lot of nuances and caveats within those answers. So in order to properly respond to that question, I'm going to have to do something I have never done on this channel. We're going to go through the entire game, from start to credits. Specifically, over the course of this video series, we are going to examine every palace, every confidant story, and the overarching narrative and design as a whole. This won't be much of a summary, and the first couple parts of the series are going to be intended for people who've already played the game to at least the halfway point. Later videos will obviously require more knowledge of the later game. We are going to deep dive this thing and find out whether or not it can stand in the ranks of the two giants that came before it. So, without further ado, let's do this. The game opens in media res on what looks like our incredibly well-designed protagonist whom I'll be calling Akira, because that's his name, trying to escape from a casino immediately after a heist. The entire section inside the casino itself is fantastic and serves as a brilliant on-the-fly tutorial and a flawless tone setter. It's honestly one of the best game openings out there in my humble opinion. Traditional JRPGs tend to suffer from being incredibly slow on startup, in a way that can easily lose people who aren't already devoted to the genre. I think it's telling that the only other JRPG I can think of off the top of my head with an equally bombastic intro is the granddad of bringing the genre to the mainstream, Final Fantasy VII. It is a fantastic hook, and it does a genius job of getting even non-fans into the story's events and settings. But it shortly gives way to Akira being caught while being told by one of the arresting officers that someone in our party sold us out, setting up a betrayal plotline that will slowly play out over the course of the game. We're going to come back to this later, but I want you to remember this right now. This was the first dramatic question asked in the story. Who betrayed us? Just put that in your pocket, keep it in mind for later. Right now though, the story's primary concern is establishing a framing device that we'll be experiencing for the majority of the game. I'm also not going to be talking about this framing device too much until it finishes what it's here to do, and the game itself catches back up with it come in-game November. But that's for later, because right now we're getting beat up, drugged, and blackmailed by cops. This is actually great, and my favorite thing about the first five or so hours of this game. It is absolutely f***ing miserable. 
Before we've recruited our entire initial party, the game has shown us police brutality, Akira stopping attempted sexual assault, Akira having his life ruined for trying to be a good person who attempted to stop a sexual assault, having the entirety of society treat Akira like a goddamn demon for trying to stop a sexual assault just because it technically marks him as a criminal in spite of them knowing nothing of his circumstances, a teacher named Kamashita who is physically, emotionally, and sexually abusing his students, one of those students being blackmailed by Kamashita for sex, one of those students trying to kill herself because she was raped by Kamashita, Kamashita expelling you when you call him out on it, and to put the shit cherry on top, the revelation that everyone, the principal, the PTA, many of the teachers, and basically everyone with power in the situation already knows and does not care. Every second of these opening hours is painful and frustrating and blindly enraging, and it's great. You see, the core theme of Persona 5 is rebellion. Rebellion against social norms, expectations, and the malevolent powers that be that seek to use and control us while we, as Phantom Thieves, attempt to reform all of it. I'm going to state that again because it's something we are going to revisit a lot in this series. The core theme of Persona 5 is rebellion against societal norms, expectations, and the malevolent powers that be that seek to use and control us while we attempt to reform all of those elements. Rebellion is as vital to Persona 5 as death was to Persona 3 and truth was to Persona 4. It is the axis around which every element of the narrative ideally should spin. And this is why I absolutely adore this intro. Every time I've played it through, I always find myself thinking over and over, this is bullshit, this isn't fair, I didn't do anything wrong. F*** this and f*** everyone who's putting me through this. What I'm feeling is injustice. And injustice is the root of rebellion. And by taking the time and effort to make the audience feel those emotions, it gives them a personal reason for wanting to assist in that rebellion. As miserable as these moments are, I wish there were more of them over the course of the game to remind us what we're fighting for. It might suck to play through, but by God does it give us a good reason to keep going. However, it's not flawless in how it builds that injustice. You'll notice in that list earlier that there was a lot of sexual assault. Now, I'm not going to say it shouldn't be there. If films and novels and every other art form can touch on it, so can games. I personally find it kind of interesting to see a game tackling the subject matter, as horrible as it is. And all things considered, I think it handles it incredibly well, and shows just how damaging it can be to victims. At this point in the story, Persona 5 doesn't shy away in the least from treating it as terribly as it should be, and stands as a powerful artistic example of the damage that such attacks can cause, and why it's so uniquely terrible. Where it slightly falls apart, though, is in its utter refusal to use the terminology it should be. Whenever it comes time to actually say what Kamashita did to Shiho, the game hums and haws around it with ellipses and other characters saying they know what happened, but outright refusing to state what happened. Shiho was raped. I deeply apologize if that upsets anyone to hear. I am not trying to shock anyone here or be edgy. But the fact is that it's almost certainly what canonically happened. And the game's refusal to verbally state that fact aloud leaves the door open for it to be denied, and makes the act feel less important and damaging than it is. To be clear, I'm not asking for some gross-ass scene where we actually see it. I don't think this game would be the right place for such a thing. But it is the right place to call it what it is by name. It feels like the game wants to talk about this weighty subject matter in an unflinching way, but won't say what the subject is. Words have power, and refusal to say those words, especially in instances like this, make them weaker. And with something as important as this, it's unacceptable to try and downplay her rape as just something that happened. I don't know if this is due to the original writers or the translation, but either way, it's honestly pathetic on the part of whoever decided to go as far as they did while caving in at the last minute when it came time to solidify the message. Jesus Christ, that got dark. Holy shit. Let's get off this subject and onto something more fun. The palaces. Which pans out because it's shortly after all of this that you are given free reign of your first one. 
This time around, each dungeon is based on the psyche of the villain of each respective arc. However, much more notable is that each dungeon is now composed of handcrafted levels rather than randomly generated mazes of the previous Persona games. As we'll see, this has its occasional drawbacks, but overall I think it was a quality call that drastically improves the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of each dungeon. Don't get me wrong, I always enjoyed the classic dungeon design, but it is kind of inherently forgettable. At no point in time when I was replaying Persona 3 and 4 did I ever once find myself thinking, Oh nice, now I get to do this dungeon, because all of them were literally the same. Sure, they'd have a different coat of paint, but ultimately there was no true difference between one dungeon and another. This change in design approach always left me excited to enter a palace, because I never knew what I would be getting next. Kamashita's palace in particular is one of the best, and a fantastic foot to start the game off on. The general artistic design of it, while starting cliché, manages to come into its own as the level continues. Starting in a generic dungeon and moving to a generic castle before having you ascend and giving way to a dilapidated, ill-constructed tower with the floor falling out from underneath it. It works as a simple metaphor for how much more damaged Kamashita's heart is the further you go into it. It's not the best level design I've ever seen, either artistically or in terms of layout, but it's definitely functional and has some interesting set pieces to it like Kamashita's throne room and the aforementioned tower climb. It is certainly more memorable than the palette swapped mazes of games past. It also allows for the addition of puzzles and mini quests which tend to range in quality from actually interesting and clever to a boring, transparent way to get you to backtrack, of which Kamashita's Palace exemplifies both. The first is this book puzzle where you have to sort them around to unlock a door. It's fairly simple and not exceedingly difficult, but it's fun and made me feel at least a little clever for solving it, while also granting Kamashita a bit of extra character building to establish him as just that more of a bastard. On the other hand, you get this mini quest about 90% the way through the dungeon with the goal of simply walking back one room and grinding random enemies till a key drops. This isn't the worst thing in the world, but it is transparent padding, and frankly, isn't fun or interesting. It's just time-consuming and lazily crafted and could have had something much more interesting in its place. On the plus side though, and perhaps more importantly, the change to a handcrafted design allows them to implement cool shit like these stairs. I got nothing to add to that. I just think little touches like this are neat. Leave me alone. Kamashita's Palace is also where the pseudo-platforming and new stealth mechanics finally get a chance to spread their wings and make themselves known. The pseudo-platforming, I think, is a universal success, to be honest. For better or worse, it doesn't require any skill to use, and it's essentially just playing a jumping animation on what would otherwise be just a flat, static path. However, the jumping around rafters, across chandeliers, and scaling towers does go an incredibly long way to making you feel like the Phantom Thief you're supposed to be, and since it requires no skill, it never gets in the way. The stealth mechanics also lend to this feel, at least when they work. Jumping from cover to cover down a hallway before jumping a guard is fantastic and absolutely roguish and stylish. However, opportunities such as that are few and far in between, especially as the game continues on. Far more frequently, you'll find yourself waiting behind cover for an enemy to walk towards you. And while waiting isn't inherently bad, for a game that is otherwise obsessed with speed, sleekness, and style, it feels pretty out of place. And the second you need to utilize any precision of movement while locked into cover, forget it. It immediately becomes a frustrating mess of the game demanding you hook onto one corner while you are desperately aiming for another. Like I said, when it works, it's fantastic. I just wish they'd put a little more effort into making it work. Also, last minor nitpick related to the stealth, they give you the tutorial for it twice. Once in the casino, and once in the castle. Not entirely sure why. Finally, it's here we get our first major boss, and this is probably the area more than any other where Persona 5 outclasses its predecessors. Much like the dungeons, the bosses have also seen an overhaul as to how they work. In Persona 3 and 4, the standard design for bosses was a pure DPS race. There were exceptions to this rule to be sure, fights like Nyx and Fortune in Persona 3 and Shadow Mitsuha spring to mind. But as a rule, your core goal in the overwhelming majority of fights was inflicting the largest amount of damage possible as quickly as possible before before your team ran out of SP while upkeeping your team's health and buffs. And while Persona 5 does keep that element, it builds on the boss fights by giving each one its own set of unique elements. In the case of Kamashita's Shadow, he has two unique mechanics. The first is his chalice, which essentially renders him completely invulnerable until it's destroyed. It's a fairly simple mechanic, but effective. It adds a layer of extra tension to the fight. You've been doing what feels like pretty solid damage to him this entire time, and now it's undone, and will stay undone until you destroy it. 
This is made worse, or in this case, better, by the fact that the chalice itself looks like part of Kamashita's character model. So realizing it's actually a separate entity is kind of infuriating, and personally made me a little mad, which added to the drama of the fight at large. It also put me on guard, because now I didn't know what to expect, which brings us to our second unique mechanic of sending party members away. Though calling it unique is slightly dishonest, because it does appear again later. However, each time it is used, it's given its own unique framing. Here it's framed as sneaking behind Kamashita Shadow to knock the crown off its head while the remainder of the party works as a distraction. During this time, the party member is completely unavailable to you, and depending on who you pick, can fail at it. For instance, sending Anne here will result in Kamashita immediately noticing her because, well, the calling card called him the utter bastard of lust for a reason. However, sending Morgana means you're now without his precious healing abilities. We'll see things like this more and more as we go through the game, but it's little touches like this that make the boss fights in Persona 5 debatably the best in the series. It gives each fight not only its own sense of mechanical and tactical identity, but it also grants them their own narrative with twists, reversals of fortune, climaxes, and even downtime. The first arc concludes with Kamashita breaking down into tears and confessing everything. I am an arrogant, shallow, and shameful person. No, I'm worse than that. I will take responsibility. I kill myself for it. What? Did he just say that? We kill himself? Mr. Kamoshida I don't got much to add to this. I just wanted to play this footage of him crying. Fuck this guy. There's a lot more to discuss in terms of how dungeon design has changed as well as the major changes to gameplay, but we'll be looking at that as we progress more through the dungeons. For now, let's take a step back and look at what has historically been the biggest draw of the Persona games, the characters. During the first palace's arc, you meet and start to get to know five major characters who act as confidants, this game's version of social links. You have Sojiro, Ryuji, Morgana, Anne, and Tai. I'm going to discuss all of these characters at some point and the changes to the social link system at large, but for right now, I want to focus on Ryuji Sakamoto, Tai Takimi, and Ann Takamaki and their confidant stories. However, before that, I want to explain the two metrics by which I'm going to be judging these specific stories. First and most obvious is the quality of the story itself, whether I find the character writing, plot premise, etc. compelling. You know, basically whether or not I think they're good stories. The other metric is how well they feed into the core theme of Rebellion. This is something Persona 3 and 4 valued very highly. Of the 21 social links in Persona 3 Portable, 17 called back to the theme of Memento Mori in one way or another, while in Persona 4 Golden, 20 of the 22 links match the theme of truth and self-discovery. This is something Persona has historically cared about, and part of what made those games so great. In addition, Persona 5 itself appears to be making a clear effort in continuing the tradition to the best of its ability, so as such, I'm going to value it too. That being said, let's start by looking at Ryuji. Ryuji is essentially a fusion between Yosuke and Kanji from Persona 4 in the best way possible. As far as the first friend characters go here, I'd say he's definitely at least as good as Yosuke. He's headstrong and determined, but he's also about as situationally aware as a pile of rocks. More than once, he loudly shouts, WE'RE THE PHANTOM THIEVES in public spaces. We literally get caught at one point because of him, and like, homie, I love you, but why are you like this? but he is still undeniably lovable as a rule. He's someone who's constantly trying his best, and oh boy does he fail to live up to that standard far more often than he succeeds, and frequently acts like a jackass in the process, but it's really hard to not love the guy for trying all the same. His confidant story stands as one of the simplest and most effective. He's trying to get back into something he loves, running, that was unjustly taken from him by someone in a position of power while coming to terms with the fact that he's partially responsible for that thing being taken away not only from himself, but his teammates as well. He screws over someone in yet another position of power who is trying to use his old teammates for his own gain, feeding back into the theme of rebellion. And ultimately, when given the chance to join back up with them, he opts against it, having realized that he's outgrown them. He doesn't need that surrogate family anymore, because now he has us. It's a nice little story showing how people can grow out of things they used to think were absolutely vital to their lives. More than that, it shows the danger of rebelling on impulse. Every problem Ryuji deals with in this arc is a direct result of him punching Kamashita out of anger. Throughout the entire story, Ryuji is never condemned by his peers for rebelling or resorting to violence, but rather for the manner and way in which he rebelled and his application of violence. 
This is an idea we'll see explored at length in other social links as well as the main plot. That while rebellion is good and beneficial, it requires that the people doing so approach it intelligently and carefully, lest they wind up harming the exact people they intended to help. It's a level of nuance that's usually left out of stories like this, but it stands true and becomes an actual problem later on. Taken as a whole, the storyline is incredibly effective at making Ryuji likable on a level that the primary story doesn't offer while feeding back into and refining the game's primary themes. This isn't my favorite confidant story, but in many ways I think it may be the best example of what I expect from them. In a perfect version of this game, this would be the standard of what to expect from each confidant. Next, let's look at Tai Takimi, this game's death arcana and local item vendor. First, let's get this out of the way. She has basically the best design out of any of the characters. I'm a major sucker for the punk rock aesthetic, and it makes me really wish there were more costume options in this game. As a person though, Takimi is once again fantastically characterized. You really get the sense that she's someone who's old enough to become incredibly world-weary, but not old enough that she's a dyed-in-the-wool cynic. Almost immediately, you get to see her be sarcastic, petty, and a little morally gray, but she is ultimately trying to do the right thing. She will trade you illegal drugs for the right to consensually poison you, but she does so to the end of crafting a medicine for a kid she's trying to help. It's incredibly endearing. Much like Ryuji's, Takimi's theming dovetails very well with the overarching narrative. Seeing an old doctor play with the lives of both her and a child to satisfy his own petty vendetta before taking him down and watching Takimi grow and excitedly complete her cure now that the powers that be have been removed is incredibly satisfying, and decidedly one of the few occasions in the game where it feels like you're sticking it to someone in a major position of power. Not only that, but it shows how the actions of people in power can lead to indirect, non-physical violence. In the non-canon version of this game where you only get rank 1 with Tai and never talk to her again, her patient dies because the chief of medicine refuses to let Tai help her due to his own pettiness. His goal isn't to hurt the patient, but it's the patient that suffers the most because of a feud she has nothing to do with. Conflicts like this are common in the real world, with political and economic entities regularly making choices that harm, if not outright destroy people who had no stake in the fight, but get caught in the crossfire all the same. And seeing it play out on a micro scale like this does an effective job of just showing how and why things like this may play out in real life. And while I'm not going to get into this because it's a whole thing, I will say that the choice of healthcare as a backdrop to all of this was most likely intentional. Even Japan's healthcare isn't perfect. All things considered, Takimi's arc is one of the few times during a confidant story where it feels like you're using your powers to legitimately reform society, rather than just doing one of your friends a favor and getting them out of a jam. It goes a long way to contributing to the game's tone and themes. Finally, let's look at Anne. I love Anne in the main narrative, especially during the first palace, which by the end is more her story than anyone else's. She probably reveals the most depth of character faster than anyone else in the cast, primarily because we meet her at her lowest point, fresh off the heels of being blackmailed for sex and seeing her only friend Shiho try to kill herself. Right off the bat, we get to see her be heartbroken, yet also furious beyond words. Probably the most notable scene where she shows this off is the one where she chooses to spare Kamashita, not out of mercy, but as a means to make him suffer the maximum amount of pain possible via humiliation and imprisonment. However, she isn't someone made of rage by any means. During downtime, we get to see her no-nonsense, earnest personality shine through, and it is incredibly charismatic. There is so much to like about her, and she is a truly great character worthy of standing alongside any of the Persona alumni. This is why it's so sad and frustrating to see her confidant story be the mangled train wreck it is. Anne's entire storyline revolves around her career as a model and trying to be the best model she can possibly be. There's bits of character building and backstory here and there that are effective, but generally the whole narrative falls flat. To be clear, I'm not saying it falls flat because it's a story about her trying to be a model. I actually think there is a lot of fertile soil for a character like Anne to grow in a narrative setup like this. However, it falls flat for two reasons. One, it has nothing to do with the core theme of Rebellion. The only character with any power in this arc, Mika, is treated as though she's in the moral right the entire time, with Anne frequently saying Mika is justified for treating her like shit. She's never punished for her eager sabotaging of not just Anne's career, but of several other models who we never see, but are explicitly told she harmed. And even if she were to get a form of comeuppance, it would beg the question of, to what end? 
Mika isn't the head of an industry or in a major position of power or anything else. She's just some random person on the same social strata as us, as scummy as she may be. As is, all we can get out of this story is the message of take what you want by any means necessary, everyone else can eat shit. Because the character that lives by that idea is idolized and rewarded for it, while Anne's arc is about learning to appreciate it, respect it, and live it. Potentially even worse, it tries to make the player complicit in her worldview, since in order to get the largest amount of points per response, you frequently have to say things that are supportive of Mika, while also demeaning Anne in the process. And this is assuming you're given a choice to condemn Mika at all, because you're pretty frequently only given a choice between saying, Mika's cool, and Mika's really cool. It's trash, and not only kind of reprehensible on an ethical level, but antithetical to the core themes and values of the game as a whole. The second reason is that, frankly, it's a bad use of her character's potential. Here we have a character of mixed ethnicity living in one of the most ethnically homogenous and xenophobic cultures in the modern world, who has experienced discrimination for that fact in the past. In addition, she's a recent abuse survivor whose best friend tried to kill herself and is currently recovering. Either of these aspects could have potentially dovetailed perfectly with the theme of rebellion and reforming societal problems. But to do so would have meant dealing with either sexual assault or racism as societal problems. And that's territory the game seems very reluctant to tread on. So instead we get a shithead workplace drama that's ill-fitted for the story it occurs in. Again, I want to emphasize that it's not the modeling as a framing device I take issue with, but rather it's use of modeling to tell a story that doesn't tie back into the core theme. Modeling could have been a brilliant setup to deal with either of these themes. She's someone who looks distinctly foreign, working a job based around her looks, but it never comes up even once. Right there is grounds for a story that explores themes of injustice and rebellion. Or how about a corrupt modeling agent who exploits his clients financially? And this is assuming we're married to the modeling premise. Where's Shiho? The best part of Anne's arc is when she and Shiho return to the roof and work through what happened. Why can't the narrative be about helping Shiho directly and visiting her in the hospital, thereby showing the real damage both abuse and abuses of power can cause, while also showing how people can work through that damage and building a compelling friendship that ties back into the core themes? Why can't it be something like that? Why can't it be f***ing anything other than a story about two people who have nothing trying to tear each other down in one of the worst showcases of toxic girl culture I've seen since Jawbreaker? This game is better than this, just what the absolute hell? If Ryuji's arc set the standard for what we should expect from a confidant story, then Anne's arc is the exact opposite. It shows exactly how to do everything wrong. The characters are despicable, the ethics are revolting, and the theming is literally counter to the story it's meant to support and enhance. It didn't occur to me till I sat down to write this, but I'm going to tell you this right now. We'll be seeing other weak arcs over the course of this whole thing, but this is it. This is the worst confidant arc in the game. And it's miserably frustrating because there was so much potential here with so many roads they could have taken to let us better understand and grow with Anne. It earnestly breaks my heart a little that we were denied that. But thankfully, we still have a lot of game to work through, and a lot of elements to examine, and a lot of good to still see. As good as this game has generally been up to this point, I can safely say the best has yet to come. So I hope you'll join me over the coming weeks as we continue to explore what this game has to offer, and, most of all, where it stands within the series it was born into. Continued in part two. And now, introducing... Patreon! Hi, I'm Ryan, and I have productive hobbies such as playing video games, making videos about video games, and also not starving to death. You can help me with all of these hobbies, especially the last one. I haven't eaten in three days. I'm using the old Patreon logo because the new one is absolute shit. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help sustain my dying body with Cheetos. I need this. I need this very badly. I drank half a bottle of whiskey before recording this bit. There's no script here. My life is in shambles. Please help. Please give me money so I can keep talking about Japanese role-playing games. If you have the means available to you, I would deeply appreciate you giving me a dollar so I can continue to talk about Japanese role-playing games. This is my life, apparently. Thank you in advance to everyone who chooses to support me. <laughs> oh shit, this is terrible. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I love you all. Peace.